Okay, so in this video, we're going to cover H1 NMR, uh, which you'll also hear referred to as proton NMR. And again, what that means, again, an H1 atom, all it's made up of is a single proton, so a lot of times you'll hear this referred to as proton NMR, and proton is just referring to the H1. And so again, if you're following along with your packet, on the front page of your packet, right, we, in the last video we talked about all the things that have to do with carbon NMR. So next we're gonna talk about all these things that have to do with HNMR. So it's listed at the bottom of the first page. So first I'm actually gonna go a little bit out of order. I'm gonna talk about environment, and then I'm gonna talk about the other two, multiplicity and integration. So environment's gonna be very similar to what we talked about with the carbon NMR. And then these other two things are brand new. So those are specific to the HNMR. So environment's gonna be the first one we go through. So I'm gonna go a little bit out of order from the packet, but then we'll kind of talk about these things and then go through some examples. So again, the environment, just like for carbon NMR, it tells you where these things are in the molecule and like what kind of attachments they'll have. And so if we go through the kind of the major uh, dividing lines, similar to what we did with carbon, um, we start at zero in the upfield region, and then for proton NMR, uh, we don't go as far in the numbers. The numbers tend to only go down to like 14, so you don't generally see anything going past 14. And again, in this NMR spectrum, we're, we're detecting the hydrogens, not the carbons. Of course, most of the hydrogens are attached to carbons, um, and so they'll kind of have similar issues going on for the same reason. And so I'm going to start down here, kind of one, two, three in the four region. And this is not going to be to scale. I'm just going to kind of put random numbers on here where important stuff shows up. But just like with carbon NMR, the most upfield position is going to be reserved for the alkyl region. And so one to two is kind of the alkyl region where we're talking about Again, the hydrogen itself, so we're talking about the hydrogen, not the carbon, and it's gonna be attached to some sort of just regular sp3 carbon, right? And we call this region, you'll hear this region referred to as the alkyl region, similar to the carbon, right? So like, again, regular sp3 carbons, those are gonna be down in the alkyl region in the carbon-13 spectra, and then H is attached to those carbons are gonna be down here in the alkyl region, the one to two region. So you get a lot of stuff down here usually. So then once you start moving more downfield, you're attaching stuff to these carbons that's gonna slightly deshield the hydrogen environment. And so in this two to three region, what you're doing is you're getting carbons that are kind of beta to double bonds. And so that's where you're gonna get, if you have like a a CC double bond or a CO double bond, that hydrogen is over here on the beta carbon, right? So we're talking about this hydrogen here. So where would that one show up, right? So it's gonna be attached to a sp3 carbon still that's attached to the double bond. So it's that allylic position, right? So the allylic position where those hydrogens are. So it's not on an sp2 carbon, it's adjacent to an sp2 carbon. Okay, so just to be clear. So that's gonna slightly, slightly deshield it um, compared to just a regular, ordinary sp3 carbon. So then to pull it even further downfield, so around four, four is very particular to where you get hydrogens that are alpha to an oxygen. So still sp3 carbon, but now it's alpha to something. It's alpha to that oxygen. And so those tend to show up right around four. Right, so we have something that's alpha to an oxygen. And again, the more electronegative that atom, the more it's gonna deshield. So oxygen is kind of the most electronegative atom you're usually gonna see. The only atom more electronegative is fluorine, and that's not as common in organic molecules, at least ones that you're gonna be analyzing with NMR. And so oxygen would be here, if it's like on a nitrogen, like if it's alpha to a nitrogen, you'd expect that to be somewhere like in here, maybe 
it just won't be as as de-shielded if it's not as electronegative. Or like a halogen, not as electronegative, it might be down here around three. Okay, but the point is, is it'll be more de-shielded than like these other ones. And so up to here, all of these ones, so in the like one to four region, all of these guys are H's attached to sp3 carbons. Okay, so they're still they're all attached to sp3 carbons just with other stuff attached to those carbons or not, right? This has like nothing special attached. These ones have stuff in the alpha position or the beta position. Okay, so to get further downfield, you need to turn it into an H attached to like an sp2 carbon. And so the next important region and again, this is not going to be to scale drawing. So once we get to seven, seven is an important number in the NMR. That's generally where you're gonna kind of hovering around that. So seven plus or minus one, right, in this region, that's where you're gonna get um, your aromatic and alkene hydrogens. So those are gonna be attached to sp2 carbons. So this is again, same trends as you would expect in the carbon NMR but for the H's instead. So again, what you're getting here is you're getting like alkenes, and again, we're talking about the H itself. So the H attached to the alkene, it's attached to an sp2 carbon, or like an aromatic ring, right? So an H attached to an aromatic ring. So it's directly attached to an sp2 carbon versus all of these ones down here are all attached to sp3 carbons. Right, so those will hover around seven. So they'll be in like kind of the six to eight range um, where seven is kind of the key number you want to look for. Okay, and then we get into kind of some special stuff down here. So once we get to like around 10, 10 is where we get aldehyde carbon, or sorry, aldehyde hydrogens. So it's in the aldehyde functional group the H that is attached to the carbonyl carbon. And again, just like in carbon NMR, we'd expect this carbon to be more deshielded. So the H attached to it is also more deshielded than in these scenarios. So it's similar trends to the carbon NMR, right? And those tend to show up almost always kind of exactly around 10, right? So it's gonna be kind of in the nine to 10 region. Okay, so that's for aldehyde specifically. So that's where you get your aldehyde H. And so just like they're kind of special in the IR, they're also special in the NMR. And so up until here, all of the H's we've investigated have been on carbon, but keep in mind, we can also have H's that are on heteroatoms. So we can have H's attached to oxygen. We can have H's attached to nitrogen. And so one of the special ones is when we have the H in a carboxylic acid. So this H is not attached to a carbon, it's attached to an oxygen. Okay, so that hydrogen in the carboxylic acid tends to be very far downfield. And so that one tends to show up anywhere between kind of 10 and 14, or I think your handout says like 10 and 13. And so that's gonna be like way down here, right? So that's gonna be where you get your carboxylic acid H's. And so when you're looking in those regions, it's really important to look there because nothing else is really going to show up there. So it's a really, it's a really kind of key region. Okay, so in addition to carboxylic acid hydrogens, there's two other kind of main types of hydrogens you'll see that are attached to heteroatoms. So again, as a reminder, heteroatom means it's attached to like something that's not carbon. So you'll see alcohols, because they have an H attached to an O, and then you'll see amines, are the other kind of major group where you'll see this. Again, okay, there's other groups, but these are the, the main ones that you'll see. And so the carboxylic acid, so just going back up to here, right? It's on OH as well, but 
uh, this one actually just generally gives you that one peak and it's always here. It's very distinctive just for this specific functional group. Okay, so the other ones, alcohols, for whatever reason, these ones are gonna be a little different. They're not gonna show up at 10 to 13. Um, they can kind of show up all over the place. And so for both of these, alcohols and amine uh, Hs, those ones tend to show up kind of all over the place. So they don't have an exact PPM range. So they generally, they can show up anywhere between like one and eight PPM. And so that's most of the spectrum, right? And so this has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with the amount of hydrogen bonding they're doing. It has to do with the concentration that they're in. Uh, sometimes it's affected by temperature or even just the humidity in the air or what solvent it's dissolved in if they're dissolved in a solvent. And so all of this really affects this PPM and so it's not reliable. So you can literally take the same sample and you can NMR it on one day and then another day and it will give you a different PPM range for that proton. Okay, and so the other characteristic that these have um, is that these H's are what we call exchangeable protons. Exchangeable H's. And so what that has to do with is the fact that if you put these substances in, say, water, the H's on the O in the alcohol and the N in the amines, those actually go through equilibrium where they're constantly coming off the molecule and going back on and exchanging with the solvent. They're exchanging with the water. So what you can actually do if you put these in like a deuterated solvent, so if you put these in D2O, you'll actually have the deuteriums will swap places with the H's on the molecule. And so in terms of the NMR, what will happen in the HNMR is these peaks uh, or the peak for the OH or the NH, this peak will disappear. And so that's an actual like experiment you can do. Um, if you have an NMR and you have a peak in your NMR and you're not sure if that peak is the OH peak or the NH peak, you can actually take an NMR, you know, see where the peak is, and then if you suspect that one of the peaks in your NMR belongs to one of these, you can mix it up with D2O and then take another NMR and then that peak will be absent. So the absent peak is the one that belonged to those. We won't actually be doing that um, in this class, but it's something that can be done or something if you do your problems, sometimes you'll come across a hint where they'll be like, oh, this peak disappears in D2O. And what they're telling you is that peak belongs to an OH or an NH. So it's a different way of kind of telling you that. And it's based on that experiment. So again, what we're doing is like if you have something like an alcohol, right? So this H would be visible in the HNMR. But then if you mix it up with D2O, that deuterium will actually swap places with the H and that deuterium is not visible. We already kind of talked about that. It's not visible in the H1 NMR. And again, deuterium is technically an isotope, it's H2, right? We already talked about that in the last video. And so it doesn't show up in the H1 NMR. H1 only detects this specific isotope. It won't detect the deuterium. So you actually wouldn't see a peak for that one. Okay, so that's what happens with those ones. And so that's kind of summarizes for the HNMR, that's what's going on with the environment. And so again, it's very similar to the carbon NMR environment in terms of the chemical shift and the PPM ranges. Um, it's just different numbers, it's a different scale. And there's a couple uh, things that are specific to the proton NMR because you have protons instead of carbons. Okay, so next I'm gonna talk about the other factors, the other information you can get from the carbon, or sorry, the HNMR. And so next I'm going to be talking about the splitting pattern, uh, a.k.a. the multiplicity of the peaks. And so this is unique to proton NMR. You don't get this issue with the carbon NMR. And so what this is going to tell us is it's going to tell us how many H's are on the neighboring carbons. And so this starts to give us a lot of very uh, useful information when we're trying to solve a structure.
because if you know you have a CH3 group, for instance, and you know that it has two neighboring hydrogens, then you know that your CH3 group is attached to a CH2 group. So it starts to piece together the individual parts of the molecule in terms of the number of hydrogens. And so the splitting pattern Uh, AKA the multiplicity, these mean the same thing. So if I ever ask you like, what's the splitting pattern of these hydrogens or what's the multiplicity of these hydrogens, those refer to the same thing. And so they're gonna split in a way that gives them N plus one peaks where N is the number of neighbors. And so I'm gonna show you an example of what I mean by that. But you also have examples in your book, in the reading assignment, and in your packet. So you'll kind of see a lot of different examples. And so we're gonna use this guy as an example. We used this one in the carbon NMR video. We're gonna use this one for proton NMR. And so for this one, we're detecting not the carbons, right? There's four different carbons. We're detecting the hydrogens. And so just like with carbons, the hydrogens can have symmetry and if they're identical to each other, then they will have one peak in the NMR. And so here, these three H's here on this methyl, all three of these are equal to each other. And so those three hydrogens will show up as one peak in the HNMR. And so we'll call that peak A these two hydrogens will show up as their own peak, right? Because they're equal to each other. We'll call that peak B. And then these three hydrogens are the same as each other. Those will show up as their own peak. That's peak C. And again, this methyl, these three H's are not the same as these three H's. They're both on methyls, but they're different, right? Because they have different neighbors. They're in different environments. And so they're going to show up as unique peaks, just like we talked about for like carbon NMR. Um, so anyway, so if we go through this and look at the neighbors, for peak A, right, we're talking about how many neighbors are on the neighboring carbon. So kind of think about this as a house. So in house A, we have three H's living there. And we're asking how many H's are living in the neighboring carbon, right? The carbon is the house, the H's are the inhabitants, the people that live there. So in the neighboring carbon, neighboring HA, right, there's only one carbon neighboring, and this carbon has zero H's. So peak A has no neighbors. There's no neighbor H's. And so as a result, there's no splitting. So there's no multiplicity. And this would result in a peak that's going to look like what we call a singlet. So a singlet means it's going to show up as a single peak. Sort of like what we saw in the carbon NMR where all the peaks were just singlets. They were just single peaks. They didn't have any shape to them. And so a singlet, we're gonna see this abbreviated often. It's just abbreviated as lowercase s for singlet. Okay, so that's for A. So peak B, Again, we're looking at, okay, this is the carbon that houses the, these two protons, so that's B. And so we're looking at the neighboring carbons. So peak B, this has two neighboring carbons. It has this carbon, which has zero hydrogens. There's no neighbors here. And then there's this carbon. This is a neighboring carbon. This one has three hydrogens in it. So B has three neighboring hydrogens. So there's three neighbors. And so what that means is it's gonna split it N plus one. So it has three neighbors plus one. It's gonna split it into a peak that has kind of four peaks to it, four tips. And we call that a quartet is the term for a peak that's been split into four. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like in a second. Okay, so quartet, we abbreviate that with a Q for quartet. And then peak C represents these three hydrogens. So there's three hydrogens here, but we want to know how many neighbors there are to these guys. So there's three, three H's living here, three dudes living here. How many H's are living next door? 
right? So there's two H's in the neighboring carbon, so it has two neighbors. And so it's going to split it into a group of three, right? So there's two plus one, so two neighbors plus one. It's going to split it into a shape called a triplet. So that's going to be a peak, that's like kind of a group of three peaks. And the symbol or abbreviation for triplet is just lowercase t. Okay, so now we're going to draw a picture of kind of what this looks like. Okay, so I'm going to move this up. And so in terms of PPM, these are all going to be kind of in the alkyl region because they're all just kind of carbons. Um, so they're going to be kind of spread from 0 to 3 ppm. So I'm not going to draw the whole spectrum, I'm just going to zoom in on this portion. That's going to be important. And so in terms of the ppm, like where are the peaks are going to show up, A and B are going to be a little more downfield than C. Right, because these are kind of in the quote unquote allylic position. They're on a sp3 carbon that's attached to a double bond. Right, so they're adjacent, they're beta to this carbonyl carbon. So A and B are going to be down kind of in the 2 to 3 region, ppm wise, chemical shift wise. And then uh, these hydrogens for peak C, peak C is going to be more in the normal region, like 1 to 2. Okay, so that's where they will show up. The multiplicity is kind of talking about what they will look like. And so a singlet, so for peak A, again, A and B are going to be in the 2 to 3 region. A is going to look like a singlet, so it's going to just kind of look like a peak with just one point on top. So a singlet just has a single point. Okay, so that's what's going on there. And so again, if you want to label what it is, it's a singlet. And that's going to represent, this is going to be peak A. Peak B is going to be in roughly the same region. So again, where these are relative to each other might be slightly off. They're going to be very close to each other. But what it will look like is B is going to look like a quartet, we said above. So a quartet, what that's going to look like, it's a peak that has kind of four points to it. And so quartets kind of look like this. And so what happens is when you start splitting these, it's all one peak, like you can see this is kind of all grouped together, but it's going to be a little taller in the middle, and then as we go out in the splitting, the outer peaks get shorter and shorter. So it's going to be symmetric as well. So if it's an even number, you'll have kind of two tall ones in the middle, and then you'll go out, and then each additional one will get shorter and shorter as we go outward. Um, but the point is, is you'll have for a quartet, again quart means four, so you'll have one, two, three, four points on your peak. And so this is all one peak. This represents peak B for those two hydrogens on the CH2 group. Um, but they've been split into a quartet pattern by their neighboring hydrogens, right? So there's kind of like, if you think about it, there's three neighbors. And I kind of think about it, the three neighbors are stabbing these ones, these guys. And so it's kind of like, see each little dip? One, two, three. It's kind of like you're taking a fork with three prongs and you're stabbing down. So you're kind of stabbing where I put those red lines and you're making a quartet. That's the N plus one. So you're stabbing it three times and the result is you get this quartet. Okay, so that's kind of what's happening there. Each neighbor is stabbing it once. Okay, so anyway, we get to peak C. Peak C we said was going to be triplet. That's going to be in the one to two region. And so that one's going to look something like this. Okay, so the triplet is going to have one big peak in the middle, and then again the outer peaks are going to be shorter than the middle peaks. That's just how it ends up looking in the spectrum. And so this one's a triplet, and we use T to kind of represent triplet. So this is going to represent peak C over here for those guys. So again, we can assess where they are. That tells us the environment, so the chemical shift. And then now we know something about how many neighbors each one has. That's the multiplicity. So the third thing that we can get from the proton NMR is going to be the integration as well. So I'm going to talk about the integration along with the same example. And so you don't actually have to do any calculations for this, so don't, don't freak out. Um, the integration is something that the computer does for you.
And when you print out your NMR, it's gonna have integration numbers on it. So integration is just gonna be a measure of the area under each curve. And the area is proportional to the number of hydrogens that belong in each of those peaks. So if we go back up, I'm gonna scroll back up to our structure from before. So if we integrated these peaks in the NMR, the relative ratio is gonna be for the relative ratio of hydrogens here. So if we go A to B to C, the ratio is gonna be three, because we have three hydrogens in A, to two, to three. So the relative integration for peak A should be three, and the integration for peak B should be two, the integration for peak C should be three. So the relative integration ratio, uh, if we do like A to B to C, is gonna be three to two to three, roughly. Right, and again, that's representing the number of H's that are in that peak. Right, so if we saw like this one, we'd say this is a singlet that corresponds to three hydrogens. This is a quartet that corresponds to two hydrogens. This is a triplet that corresponds to three hydrogens. And so a lot of times you'll see this notation where they'll list the multiplicity with the comma and then the number of hydrogens that go with it. So you'll see that in a lot of the problems that you'll see in your book or in the handouts. Okay, and again, when you integrate this on the computer, you might get different numbers, but the ratio will be the same. So ultimately you want to get the numbers that add up to the numbers of H's in your formula. Cause it could give you like a ratio, right? Of like six to four to six, that's the same ratio. But if you know that you only have eight hydrogens in your formula, then you need to divide that ratio by two to get the ratio that matches your, your molecular formula. Okay, so those are the kind of the three pieces of information that you need to kind of work on your, and interpret your HNMR, right? So when you look at it, you're looking for PPM, what's the environment? You're looking for the integration, how many hydrogens does each peak represent, right? So if it's three, that's usually a methyl group, right? If it's two, that's usually a CH2 group or something like that, and so on and so forth. Right? And then you also want to look at the multiplicity because then that tells you what they're next to. Right? So if you look at this one, if you see a triplet that integrates to three, that tells you that you probably have a CH3 group. Right? And then the triplet tells you that it's next to something with two hydrogens. So it's probably next to a CH2. Right? And so if you go again, match that with your structure, let's say we didn't know the structure, that's consistent with what we see up here, right? We have a CH3 group that is next to a CH2 group. So it's telling you that kind of with the splitting, right? Or like this one, this one's telling you you probably have a CH2 group that is next to a CH3 group. Or if you have a singlet, right? You have a methyl group that's next to a carbon or next to something with no hydrogens on it, right? So that's kind of telling you all that information there. So that's the kind of information you want to pull out of, out of the proton NMR. Okay, so we're going to do this example. And again, there's a bunch of H's on this one. I drew them all in. We did this one with the carbon. And so for this one, we have that symmetry we talked about with the carbon NMR. Um, that exists as well for the HNMR. So like these two carbons we said were the same. And so all the H's on them are equivalent to each other. So like all six of these hydrogens are equivalent to each other. So they're all gonna show up as the same peak. So we're gonna call that peak A, right? These are all the same. They're chemically equivalent, right? This would be peak B. Then this one's unique, we'd have peak C. And then these six are all the same as each other, right? These are all the same. We're gonna call that peak D for those six. And then in terms of PPM, so in terms of their chemical shift, right? These are all gonna be in the alkyl region, in the one to two kind of PPM region because they're all just on sp3 carbons that are just attached to other sp3 carbons. Right, we do have this bromine here, but there's no H's on its alpha carbon. So this one would be a little, if there was something here, it would be more downfield, but there isn't. So these are all gonna be 
in that alkyl region, which is the 1 to 2 ppm region. Okay, so if we want to put this together, I'm just going to draw the two, like I'm just going to draw the 2 to 1 region just to like kind of expand it. And so if we want to draw peak A, and again, these are all going to be here. It's going to be messy. Sometimes you actually get overlap where you get two peaks that kind of like they merge into each other just because they're not single peaks anymore. So it gets messy sometimes. Um, but we'd see A, and what would be the multiplicity of A? So how many, so again, how many, we're not answering how many are on the carbon, we're answering how many are on the neighboring carbon. Zero. There's zero, so what would be the multiplicity? One, singlet. It'd be, yeah, a singlet. So that's what we call the one. So A would be a singlet with an integration of what? Six. Six, there'd be six in that peak and it would be a singlet. So you'd see something like just a tall singlet. So it'd be like a singlet with six H's. So you'll see that kind of notation, like that means the multiplicity and then this is like the integration, how many H's are in there. All right, so that would be for peak A. Singlet. The S is for singlet. All right, so again, S is for singlet. If it's two, we call it a doublet. So we use D for doublet. T for triplet, Q for quartet, and then if it's more than a quartet, we're actually going to call that a multiplet. So anything more than a quartet, in this class at least, we're just going to call that a multiplet. And that just means it has more than four. So then it starts to get messy, it starts to just look like a blob, the peaks aren't as defined. And that's all you, all you need to know for, for this. It does get more complex, but you don't need to know it for this class. Okay, so anyway, we're going to draw peak B next. So what's the multiplicity of peak B? It'll be a doublet, yes, because again, it has on its neighboring carbon, it has one H. So it only has one neighbor. There's none on this neighbor. There's only one on this neighbor. So it's cumulative. So you want to count all the neighbors up and then use that for the splitting. So it will be a doublet and it'll be in the alkyl region. So you'll see something, I don't know, like this. And so we call that a doublet D. And what's the integration? It would have two, yeah a ratio of two for the integration. Okay, how about peak C? What would be the multiplicity for peak C? How many neighbors does it have? Six. It has eight neighbors. So if we could see all the splitting, it would actually be like a non-net or something like that. Um, but ultimately, once you get above four, it starts to just look like a blob. So it'll just kind of look like this. Like you'd see like nine little nubs maybe or it'll just look like a blob. And so we can just call that a multiplet. So we just use M and the integration would just be what? How many H's is in that peak? Just one, yeah. And that would be for peak C. All right, so peak C has eight neighbors. So it would have a splitting pattern of nine, but we're not, realistically you don't ever see it that detailed. It starts to break down the resolution of the what we can see. It just tells you it has a lot of neighbors. You're like, okay, there's a lot. Okay. Um, okay, and then for peak D, what would be the multiplicity of peak D? Doublet. Doublet. Doublet, right? Because these have one neighbor on the neighboring carbon. So it's going to be a doublet, and it's going to integrate to what? Everyone, what's it gonna what's it gonna integrate to? Six. 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 
And so what that will look like, again, the, sh the sizes are going to be different because of the different shapes. Um, but like a doublet that corresponds to six hydrogens will be bigger than a doublet that's only two hydrogens because it's literally the area under the curve is representative of how many hydrogens there are. Um, but it will integrate that for you on the computer and tell you that. Okay, so you see something like this. And of course, they might not be all separated out like this. Sometimes they overlap with each other and it gets messy. Like you might have a doublet poking out of the multiplet and weird stuff like that. Okay, but we'll sort that out. I mean, ultimately, this is telling you you have a bunch of alkyl groups. Yeah. Um, well, so I did ABCD because I just labeled them in order, like where they would be generally in, like from downfield to upfield. Um, but generally, what you'll do is you usually start with a spectra, not a structure. And then in the spectra, we'll get into labeling more in the lab. Um, we always label the peaks as they show left to right ABCD and then assign them to the structure. Yeah, so normally you label them all in order, or if it's a carbon, you number them all, one, two, three, four, five, and then you put the numbers on the, st on the spectra, or on the structure. So normally we're going the other way, starting with spectra going towards structure. Okay, so we're going to do another example, because examples is the best way to get through this stuff. So we're going to do this guy, just to talk about heteroatoms. And so, okay, so on this one, let's draw all the H's in. And of course, this one is already there. Okay, so this is our first example where I've done one that has a heteroatom. And so when you have H's attached to a heteroatom, so O or N is what you guys are going to see, um, they don't play the splitting game. So remember, heteroatom means like an oxygen or a nitrogen. It means something other than carbon or hydrogen. So it's on a hydrogen. These don't split. So the heteroatom ones, they don't play the splitting game. That means they don't split their neighbors, they don't stab their neighbors, and the neighbors don't split them. So they're always going to be singlets, and they don't split their neighbors. So they don't play the splitting game, ever. Okay, so heteroatom H's will always be singlets. Okay, so it's kind of like they, they're not attached, so think about it that way. So kind of imagine this dividing line here. When you're thinking about splitting, the splitting does not go across that line. Okay, so just ignore it. It's not playing the neighbor game. It's off on its own island. It doesn't care. Okay, so for this one, so let's look at this peak here. Let's call this one peak A. And then these ones are all symmetric, so this is going to be peak B. And then we'll do this, this heteroatom guy, we'll call that peak C. So we're expecting three peaks because we have three different types of hydrogens on this molecule. Okay, so peak A, we're expecting peak A to kind of show up. That one's alpha to an oxygen. Which is going to pull that one down to around 4 ppm. So that's a special one. So when you have an H that's alpha, it's on the alpha carbon to an oxygen, it's going to get pulled downfield to four. And then the ones on B, those are kind of normal. Those ones are going to show up, you know, in the one to two region, or maybe two to three, since they're closer to an O. So those are going to show up somewhere between like one to three ppm. And then of course the number C, or letter C rather, it's not a number. That one's going to show up. It can really show up anywhere. It can show up anywhere between 1 and 8 ppm. So it's hard to predict those ones. They're not very predictable. You just kind of take your NMR and see what you see. 
because it can show up different places on different days. The temperature affects it, all kinds of stuff. So if we put that information together and we want to sketch like a spectra for that one. Um, we're not going to have anything really above 4, so I'm just going to draw from like 4 to 0. So A is a peak. We're expecting that one to be around 4. What is the multiplicity of A? So it's going to be around 4. What's the multiplicity? Yeah, it'd be multiplet. It has six neighbors, so it would be like a heptet, but we're just going to call it a multiplet. So it'd be something blah, 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 blah. Going to have a bunch of peaks. And that's what it will look like. It'll just look like a little fuzzy blob. You're not going to see all seven peaks. They're too small. So that one's going to be a multiplet. What's the integration for peak A? Yeah, it'd be one. And so that's peak A. Peak B, we said that one's going to show up somewhere around here, maybe around two-ish. Uh, and that one's going to look like what? What's the multiplicity of peak B? Doublet, because it has one neighbor. Those carbons each have one neighbor. So it's going to be a doublet around two-ish. And what's the integration? Six. There's six hydrogens in that peak. So that's peak B. And then peak C is going to be what multiplicity? It's a singlet, right? Those ones don't split. They don't split their neighbors. The neighbors don't split them. They're not involved. So they're going to be singlets. And again, it can really show up anywhere. Let's just put it here because why not? And so this could be peak C, and that's going to be a singlet, and it's going to integrate to 1. But again, the PPM is really variable for this one. It's not necessarily going to be at 3. It can show up kind of all over the place. Why is C singlet? Because the header atom ones, remember, they don't split. They don't participate in this game. All right, so that's one example of a type of proton that doesn't partake in splitting. There's two other situations where this could happen as well. Okay, so one is the aldehyde H. So again, we talked about this one. It has a special bend in the IR spectra. It's also special in the NMR. So aldehyde Hs also do not play the splitting game. So again, it's kind of like this carbonyl is on its own little island. The splitting doesn't go across that bridge. OK, so the aldehyde H's don't play the splitting game. So it's a special case. And so like for this one, right, we're expecting to see three peaks. We're expecting to see you know these two peaks and then one for the aldehyde. So aldehyde H's are always singlets because they don't split. Um, and those are the ones that show up around 10 ppm. So it's pretty distinct. So when you see those, you're like, oh, I have an aldehyde. Like it's the only thing that shows up there, really. And then you know the IR can support that as well. So you should see a diff additional. It's kind of like a combo. You're like, oh, I definitely have an aldehyde now. I know it. OK, and then I'm not going to go through and draw this one. But again, you'd expect to see this one. Um, again, it's, it's in that allylic position. It's allylic to this carbonyl. right? So that's going to be around 2 to 3 ppm. That's the environment. You're expecting it to have a multiplicity of 4, because it has three neighbors, quartet. And then you're expecting it to integrate to two hydrogens. So those are the three pieces of information you need to analyze. right? Where is it? What is its multiplicity? 
how many are there. Because those three pieces of information together help you solve the structure for each hydrogen. Right, and then this one over here is just kind of a normal alkyl one. That's going to be around 1 to 2 ppm. It's going to be a triplet. It's going to have three hydrogens in it. So kind of piecing all that stuff together. Okay, so that's our second example of an H that does not split. Our third example is the weirdest example, and it has to do with symmetry, which I know you all love. Because you all make happy noises whenever I say it. So let's do this example. So here's an example of a meso compound. It doesn't have to be meso, it just has to be symmetric. But meso compounds are symmetric. So for example, these two hydrogens here um, are symmetric to each other, and they're also neighbors. So symmetric hydrogens don't split each other. So they'll split other things. They'll split their neighbors if their neighbors are different, but they won't split each other if they're identical to each other. And so I kind of think about it like these are like, I don't know, these H's are running around stabbing people left and right, but then they encounter someone who's identical to them. And they're like, oh, you're me. I don't want to stab you. So they don't. <laughs> yeah. So like these will these will not split each other. So it's kind of like the splitting doesn't go across here, but they will split and be split by these neighbors because they're different. So these will split each other, but these will not split each other. Okay, and then we have another symmetry point down here. So these two groups are identical to each other. So they won't split here. So you basically won't split if the neighbors are identical. Okay, so for example, let's call this HA, HB, HC down here. So like A, based on this, what would the multiplicity of A be? Based on what we just said. So how many neighbors does it have total? It has one, two, three neighbors, but the identical one won't split it. It won't split itself, but these will split it. So what will it be? Triplet. It'll be a triplet. So it's a triplet. Um, it's alpha to a chlorine, so it's going to be, I don't know, around 3 ppm-ish, and it'll integrate to 2, right, because there's two of them. Right, there's one here, there's one here, they're equal to each other, they're going to both be in the same peak. So peak B, what will be the splitting pattern of peak B? So how many neighbors does it have? Yeah, it has two over here and one over here. So three total neighbors, so it'll be a, a quartet. So it'll be quartet. It's kind of normal, so it'll be kind of in that, you know, one to two range. And it'll integrate to four H's, right? Don't forget the symmetry. There's two here, two here that are equal. What will be the splitting of peak C? So it has four neighbors, right, but there's symmetry, right? So the ones that are identical to itself won't split it. So remember, these won't split it, these will. So it will be a 
triplet, right? Because the, these two will split it, but these two won't because they're the same as itself. All right, so that one will be around 1 to 2 ppm, right? It's even farther from the chlorine, um, so it'll be a little more upfield, and then it'll also integrate to 4 H's. Okay, so those are just kind of three special cases, right? So heteroatoms, aldehydes, and symmetric hydrogens won't split each other. Or, or they're... <clears throat>